Hello and welcome to Eureka Lab. My name is Bethany Brookshire. I'm the author of this blog and I'm here to talk to you about what it's like to love science, um, to work in science, and to find out what careers in science, technology, engineering, and math are all about. Uh, welcome to our second Google Hangout, talking about science careers. Um, today I'm here with Dr. Caleb Wilson, a postdoctoral researcher in immunology. He's at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine in the Abramson Family Cancer Research Institute. Um, and he's on Twitter as at HeyDrWilson. And he's here to talk to us today about what he does in his job, why he loves science, and why you should love science too. So hello, Caleb. Hello, how are you doing? Pretty good. Thanks for coming on. You're welcome. Um, good to be here. So I just wanted to ask, what is your job now? What is a postdoc and what do you do? A postdoc is, uh, think about it like an um, internship or an um, like apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. So after we get our doctorate, we need a little bit more training. Um, so this is an opportunity for us to to do something different than what we did for our uh, to, the work we did for our PhD, the research that we did for, to get our PhD. Okay, and so you study immunology. What exactly do you study? Uh, so the, to, first, let me define what immunology is. This is basically the the study of the balance between disease and health. Um, so the body is always in this process of being healthy and fighting off uh, any types of diseases, whether it's cancer or something from within or an infection from bacteria, a parasite, a virus, so something from the outside. Uh, and specifically, so we're always where, fighting off diseases? Yeah, there's always a balance. Uh, your body's in like this constant battle throughout your entire life of trying to do everything it needs to do to stay healthy but also um, keep things out. But, uh, but specifically what my work does is I, I work to teach T cells how to find cancer cells and HIV infected cells and kill them. So what are T cells? Uh, T cells are a type of white blood cell. So T cells will coordinate the response. So, they, so they're basically like... Uh, let's say the quarterback of the, if you're in the football, sort of like the quarterback of um, the immune system. Of the, and if you're in the basketball, it's like the point guard. So the point guard or the quarterback kind of calls the plays, you know, get everybody lined up correctly, and, and then say, okay, this is what I need to do. You need to be here or do this to execute this play. So and so by, a play would be an immune response. Okay, so by coordinating together um, the... T cells say as like the quarterback, they like organize the defense against the bacteria or infection. Or in this case, you're looking for organizing a defense against cancer and HIV. Yes. That's pretty cool. So yeah. that's what you do overall. What do you do like on a day-to-day -day basis? What's your life like? So daily, uh, get in in the morning and so there's always some T cells in culture. Um, what does that mean? So we what well, back up for a second. So I mentioned that we teach T cells how to find and kill cancer and HIV infected cells. And so what we do is from the research side is we have healthy people that come in and donate blood, and then we take their take their blood and then and we call fractionated. So we put it, we take the blood and divide it into different parts. The part of the blood that I get is uh, T cells. So some people may order B cells. They may order um, other types of white blood cells. I use T cells from actual people. So that's called primary uh, cells. And so I'll take those. So for instance, today's Tuesday. Um, put an order in. I'll get cells later today. I'll take them and. Um, Put them in a, a, a plate or a dish, uh, like petri dish in culture. Uh, give them, put them in like a solution that has nutrients in it and uh, other things that stimulate the cells to to get them to do what I want to uh, want to do. Cool. So people actually come in and give blood for science. 
Absolutely. Or where does that blood does does it just come from a blood bank or do they you have volunteers or? No, this isn't from a blood bank. So we actually have people that are called uh, the phrase is healthy donor. So they're people that they don't have any known diseases, uh, no cancers, infections, and so they come in and I think it's maybe every six weeks or so. They cycle through. They'll give blood on Tuesday, sometimes on Wednesday, but Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, so it's uh, it's this these donations are just for us. So it's just for science. It's not someone that's donating blood for hospitals and then we get a portion of it. This is just for the research. That's really cool. Have you ever donated blood for science? Actually, I have. Uh, so let me see. A couple years ago, uh, we were. Do, uh, they were doing like a larger scale um, experiment to before a clinical trial, and they wanted to get as many different people as possible. So I uh, gave blood to that um, to so it can be tested. So I think uh, it's probably published somewhere. I don't know exactly if it's my cells or not. So uh, so someone really cool. has access to my DNA out there. Well, from yeah. our research group. Like that's dangerous, though. I mean, isn't it dangerous to you? Do you have to wear like lots of Equipment. Yeah, so so we have a, a, a tissue culture room that's specifically for uh, well, you can our tissue culture room because some people are working with live HIV, so HIV they can affect you. Wow. Uh, we wear gowns and you know double glove, wear wear um, uh, eye protection, and you know we make sure that. Everything gets bleached, and you try not to do anything that's going to expose you. But that that is a danger. Um, if unknowingly, if a pa if a <clears throat> excuse not a patient, but a a donor has contracted an infection, uh, let's say like hepatitis or something, and they they don't know it, and they donate blood, and then you know someone comes in, they can do it. But we have we, you know you get vaccinated for uh, a couple forms of hepatitis and some other things to uh, help you. Uh, be safe from it. So, so there's always safety protocols. As long as you're doing what you're supposed to be doing and you're doing it in a safe way, taking your time and being careful, uh, it's pretty easy to work with. Okay, so what do you do like on a daily basis? What kind of so you know you get your cells and then what happens? All right, so so I'll get the cells and what we have to do. What we do first is uh, activate them. So we have these small metal beads that has uh, proteins coded to them, and these proteins are called antibodies. And so we mix them with the cells and then to activate the cells. Uh, the cool thing so that we do is... antibodies are like a trigger for T cells? Well, so these antibodies are to... They are they they connect with or bind to uh, proteins on the T cell surface. That, and these, these proteins on, its, on the T cell are what activate them. So it's... Um, it's called like the, uh, it's mimicking the T cell receptor or the the portion of the T cell that um, it's kind of like a handshake. So whenever whenever there's a <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> an immune response, in order for the T cell to know what's going on, it basically goes around and, and, and shakes hands with other cells in the immune system. And so so imagine if you had a coin or something in your hand and you shook somebody's hand and based on what was in your hand it would determine how you responded to it. And so that so T cells basically go around and shake hands with other cells called uh, antigen presenting cells. And these antigen presenting cells, let's say for instance if there's a bacteria, they'll take the bacteria and engulf it like an amoeba. Uh, and then it'll pull the bacteria inside itself and then chop it up uh, like on a, a cutting board in the kitchen. but there, it's more a little more complicated than that. <laughs> It'll take portions of that bacteria and put it on a protein, and then that protein will be like one hand, one hand, and then the T cell will come over with this other hand, and they'll shake hands, and the T cell say, "Oh, okay, I know what that is. So now this is how I'm going to coordinate a response to that." Um, so it's like what, passing signals along. Exactly. So in order for the T cell to know what it needs to do, uh, it has to get the information. So it's a way of communicating to the T cell, here's a problem, this is what the problem is, and this is what, and then the T cell decides, okay, this is how we're going to deal with it. Okay, so now that you've activated your T cells, you know, uh -huh. by making them handshake, what else, what happens? 
So we wait for uh, 24 to 36 hours, and we we do something that's cool to the T cell. So we actually take a form of HIV to put genes into the T cell, right? So and HIV is the protein that produces that can cause people to suffer from AIDS. Exactly. So, but 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 this form of HIV isn't it? It does not. It, like it doesn't. It won't make more uh, HIV. So it's basically, it's it's just a way to to put a gene to take a gene that T cell doesn't have and give it to it. And so I mentioned before in teaching the T cells how to uh, kill HIV and cancer. So one of the so let's talk about cancer for a second. One of the issues with cancer is cancer is from within your own body. In general, your body does not attack itself. So I mentioned, so if we think about the T cell going around shaking hands, one of the things that happened is it shakes hands with cells and it says, okay, hey, all right, you're cool, you should be here, um, this isn't a problem. And it's you're recognized. Cool. I know you. Yeah, it's recognized yeah. as what we call self or part of you. And so since a cancer cell is from your own cells, oftentimes T cells and other cells in your body have a difficult time recognizing the cancer as a problem. And so that's how cancers grow. They have ways of hiding themselves. It's kind of like uh, they, they're stealthy. Yeah. And so what we do is we'll, we'll give a gene or put DNA into the T cell, and then that DNA is like a specific type of glove. So I remember before with the, the handshake, so what we actually do is give a, a a glove that can actually recognize cancer. So we oh. tell so we tell the T cell that now you have the ability to see this specific type of cancer. Or in the con or if you talk, think about HIV, we give it a different type of glove or a gene that says now you can see HIV. And so okay. yeah. And so and and it's and it's and that's called um, that's called genetic engineering. So before we give the T cell those genes, it does not have the ability to see uh, certain cancers yeah, okay. or HIV. So we give it that ability by giving it DNA or genes. And the form of HIV that we, we use in the lab, it's just a way to to give uh, HIV that the DNA or give it the, the specific gloves to see cancer or HIV. So what you do is you take the virus, HIV, which can inject DNA into cells, and you exactly it gives DNA to the T cell, and then exactly. the T cell has that DNA like a glove and can be like, cancer cell, I see you. Exactly. You down. Exactly. That's awesome. You, yeah, it's like you can't hide anymore. We know you're here. We're going to find you, and you have to go. Cool. So, uh, how did so you started? So you're working with, you know, cancer. Now you're working with, you know, you're using HIV. You're using human cells in the laboratory. How did you get to where you are now? How did you become a postdoc? How did you get into science as a career? What steps did you take? So, uh, going back to high school, I was very interested in biology. I uh, did well in biology classes and, and my other science and, science and math classes. And when I went to college, um, I actually started off as an undecided major. And part of the reason was, so I had this interesting background where I did well in uh, science, technology, engineering, mathematics courses or STEM, but I also uh, had experience in couple different phases of construction. So I learned how to operate heavy equipment, bulldozers and stuff. Um, I learned how to do carpentry and build cabinets and build houses. So I had this like this, you know, kind of divergent interest or, you know, these interests that are like very separate. Although mathematics and a lot of uh, science is used in construction, we don't generally think about it that way. And so while I was an undergrad at Alcorn State University uh, back home in Mississippi, I started, uh, again, excelling in the classes. I decided to major in biology. 
And like most students, when you think about biology, what we're mostly familiar with is uh, becoming a physician or a nurse or um, you know or maybe a science teacher. So the, so the the types of careers are that you think about is limited. And I had a, a an interesting experience is in that a professor from the University of Wisconsin came down and gave a science talk. And it was very exciting. And you know, he was studying um, this parasite uh, that's found in, uh, in Africa. And the parasite's uh, given to people so it lives in a fly. And if the fly bites someone, the person gets the uh, parasite and they get what's called sleeping sickness. And so I was really interested in it, and I talked to him about it. And he said, well, why don't you come up and uh, work in the lab over the summer? Wow. That's yeah, and it was like, yeah, it was like, whoa, okay, really. You know, it's like, so the reason I was excited about that is that I remember in high school and um, in college looking in the back of the textbooks, and after each chapter there are references. And so those references are for um, research papers that were read and uh, the author of the books got them together and, this, and and wrote it in a way that kind of in a coherent way so you can understand exactly what's going on in the biology book. But they're the papers that, you know, determine what we know about biology. They're the research that... Exactly. So, you know. so now I'm, that's one of the things that I'm doing. I'm generating research papers that one day will help contribute to, you know, uh, therapy for uh, HIV and cancer and some of the work I did as a graduate student, the uh, general knowledge of how the immune system works. And so, you know, so I go to Wisconsin, you know, I'm new to this, having worked in a lab, you know, it took a lot of time to teach me. Now, this is the coolest thing. And so very, in very few times in life do you actually do something that, that's a part of like this bigger picture, and you're the only person that knows it. So I did an experiment. Uh, we what we were doing is infecting mice with this parasite uh, called um, trypanosomes. And after doing the experiment and uh, collecting the data and analyzing it, you know, I'm looking at it and I'm like, wait a minute, I'm the only person in the world that knows this. It's like what? Like this is data. You know, it's like it's you know it's 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 like wow, like no one else in the world knows this. I did an experiment. I'm the only person that knows this, and it worked. And it's like, like that was like the eureka moment. It's like, wait a minute. Spending a career doing something that no one else knows, and, and like that's what science is. You're constantly trying to answer questions that have not been answered before. So you're spending your career creating new knowledge, new things exactly. that nobody knew before. Yeah, and like that's 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 the coolest thing about it, you know. Like that's every like when I think about it, it's like really exciting. It's like there, if you take a textbook, there's information in a textbook. However, let's say the textbook was written in 2012. So there are thing, there there are experiments and research papers that will come out after that textbook has been published, and what will happen is the next time that they make an addition, a new version of that textbook, that new information may be in there. So, so you might be in a textbook someday? I hope so. It would be cool, you know, it's to be, you know, referenced in a textbook. Uh, because that's, you know, if it's in a book, that's like, that's a big deal. It's going to be around for a while. So it's very, it's, it's so cool that you, you know, you really love science and the process of discovery. Um, are there any things about being a scientist that are very difficult, that are not not so positive? Uh, failing. So so generally, uh, the, there's a lot of failure in science. And that's because, you know, you think about how you're going to set up an experiment and you create a hypothesis and you know, you're trying to disprove the hypothesis. So, so basically, you're trying to work to create a failure. Uh, and sometimes experiments don't work. You know, you may think that um, you know this, you know, doing these particular things may work, and it may be more complicated than you thought. And so, it's uh, what we, you know, in a very nerdy way, call the re in research. You know, you do the experiment, then you have to 
you know, repeat the experiment, make sure it's, you know, validate the data, make sure it's actually what it says it is. And so, you know, you spend a lot of time doing that. And, you know, it's, and sometimes it's slow. So if you think about, um, I think about science like waves in the ocean, right? You know, sometimes it's, you know, it's calm, not a lot going on. And then, you know, you get a wave in, and that peak of the wave is like where the most energy is. And so you, you know, you try to ride that wave as long as possible, and eventually the wave dies out, and there's, you know, the space between that wave and the next wave. So, yeah, the best case scenario is to have a lot of waves coming in, but sometimes it's a little calm, and you spend a lot of time reading and trying to figure out what you're doing. So now you're, so you went to college, you did research, you went to grad school, and you did more research, and now you're in a postdoc doing more research. What are you going to do next? Next, I'm uh, looking into uh, faculty positions. Uh, so, I want to work at a uh, university and and teach other students uh, to do the things that I've been able to do and, and recruit them and, and get them excited about it. Um, also, I'm very interested in policy. So, I I what that means is the trying to decide what we're going to do research on, uh, where the funding is, what type of things we should do, uh, because that, the so basically it's prioritizing. So the priorities is what shapes science. Because so science takes be a, money, and there's exactly. only so much money. <laughs> and and that's, that's the main thing. Science is expensive, and so we need to, as, uh, so one of the things I, a uh, couple things I think is that scientists should spend more time talking to the general public. Uh, the public through their tax dollars, funds, has funded my research my entire career um, and pretty much funds the entire uh, scientific enterprise, we call it, but all the science. Um, and, you know, to spend time to help the public understand what we're doing. And so we're doing a lot of cool things, and we should spend time helping the public understand what we're doing while we're doing it. Uh, the other thing is outreach. So, like I mentioned before, when I started college, there was a, a limited number of careers that I knew about, and you know, and that most people think about when they're in biology or a certain or science and other types of sciences. And so, one of the things that I want to do, when I try to do, is I spend time doing what we call outreach. I interact with students uh, in the local community, uh, other types of groups, to you know, help them with science and help kids get interested in science because it's cool. Um, you know, there, there are very few things in life that, like, okay, this is why I love science. So I, <laughs> I, I get paid to think. You know, I get paid to learn stuff. I get paid to do experiments and try to figure out things that no one else knows. And in most cases, uh, kids are very interested in learning. You know, they're inquisitive. And I along with a few other people, we try to interact with students to help boost that, you know, help maintain that interest. So I didn't, so for instance, I didn't meet a scientist until I was in college. So I'm in, you know, late teens, early 20s. The first time I actually talked to a scientist, and that was because they were my professors. However, what I want to do is reach out to students that are in elementary and middle school, high school and college, and and give them an opportunity to meet scientists from you know a very early point, and and that means that they're thinking about science a little differently. You know that they may. My goal is to try to recruit you know, students from various backgrounds and 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 uh, socioeconomic stakes to to get them uh, to get them interested in science. And the best way to do that is to go out and interact with them. Um, and that's what you find. It will be the same way of someone's interested in becoming a carpenter, you don't all of a sudden get to your 20s and you're interested in it. You're likely interested in it when you're a kid. You think it's cool to build stuff. And if you can meet a carpenter or meet someone that can start teaching you and help you learn more about it and get you in, engaged in it, then you your your interest peaks and builds and then you, know, you can go into that as a career. And so I think it's easier for students to get into science if they interact with scientists as early as possible. 
So you're already doing some outreach stuff. You're you're on uh, you do a group on Twitter called the Dark Side. So what what is the Dark Side? Uh, the the Dark Side. Huh? So that's <laughs> so that's uh, so this past uh, early in 2013, um, there were some other scientists and journalists that uh, I was interacting with on Twitter, and one of the things that we were concerned with is. If you look at the African American community, uh, when it comes to science, what we generally hear about is, you know, the negative uh, health implications. You know, high cancer rates, high obesity, diabetes, and all these things, life expectancy. And we were becoming a little frustrated with media outlets, uh, particularly media outlets that cater to the African American community or minority communities. Uh, in that there has to be more of a positive spin on this and to get you know to get the communities interested in science in general and the science behind stories and and thinking about health from a different perspective because if you're you know if you're constantly bombarded with the negative you begin to internalize that versus thinking about you know exactly what does it mean to have this particular health issue or so what are some of the things you can do to prevent it and and, and work to uh, change the, those perceptions. So you so want people we, to focus on, you know, positive ways they can impact, you know, their health as opposed to the negative things that are happening. Exactly, health or just technology in general. So, for instance, uh, there, there there are some statistics that if you look at social media, uh, women and minority women and African Americans in general, along with other minority groups, use social media. At a higher rate uh, than whites and other groups, right? So, it, this is one of the cases you have minorities actually using this these platforms more. And so, what that means, there's an opportunity to interact and to get information directly to uh, people on social media. So, so basically, so if you think about it. Usually, science is going on at research institutions and universities. And so unless you are near or have a way to getting to those institutions and universities, you don't really inter you don't have like a connection to science. So what we so what we say is basically look, we're gonna remove that barrier. We're gonna go directly to people. And so um I've so created you use dark social sorry, media to sorry, you use social media to um, help connect people with science. Exactly. So, so I mentioned before the the outreach and being available. So, if someone's watching this, um, so if someone's watching this video, they can say, "Well, wait a minute. Okay, I don't understand some of the things that uh, Dr. Wilson said. So, let me contact him on Twitter." Okay. So, we start a Twitter conversation. I can direct you to some more information. Uh, we can have some conversations about it. To you know, help you understand it, and that could be anyone. I could be a student, it could be a teacher, and that student and teacher could be, you know, from you know somewhere here in Philadelphia. They can be across the country, or they can be in another country. And that's the that's the beauty of social media is that it allows people to interact that otherwise we would have no way of accessing each other. Uh, and so eventually we we create an official name for the dark side. It's the National Science and Technology News Service. And so uh, this the group of scientists and journalists, one of the things that we do is we write articles about science issues or uh, health related issues. And so it, and it, the, the overall goal is for the media outlets that are um, the media outlets that want these stories, we're building a repository. So if someone's, if there's a story about HIV or cancer in a certain aspect, and they want someone that's doing that type of work or that can give them an expert opinion, they can reach out to me. Or if they're looking at uh, science communication, they can reach out to uh, Dr. Danielle Lee or Dan Lee Five. So there's, so basically, if someone, so it's if you have a question, we have people that can answer those questions. So if 
uh, media outlets or editors want to reach out to someone, or if the public reads a story and it's like, wait a minute, um, what's the deal with the story with um, gene modified foods? You know, what's the deal with it? what exactly is that? We can put you in contact with someone that can explain that, or if a particular media outlet is doing a story on it, we can put them in contact with somebody. And the the major thing is for the media outlets that are particularly um, catering to minority communities, what's beneficial is you can actually find a scientist or a journalist that looks like someone from that community, right? And so that's a little bit easier because, so f as a general example, if you look at the history of science and medicine in the U.S., um, African Americans are a bit skeptical because one of the things that happened is people mentioned the Tuskegee Project. And what that was is it was a very bad um, chapter in medicine and science where people in Tuskegee, men in Tuskegee, Alabama, uh, were, they had syphilis infections or this bacterial infection that's very dangerous. Uh, that's a, what's called a uh, sexually transmitted infection or sexually transmitted disease. And they weren't treated, so they were basically allowed. Uh, the disease was allowed to progress, and they became very sick and had all the side effects and problems that and complications related to syphilis. And so that basically and this was done without their knowledge. Yes, like and they weren't informed. They were given, they were given syphilis and not told, and then not treated. It was not. Not a good time in American history. <laughs> exactly, and that, that's the horrible part about it. It wasn't, hey, yeah, it's un, unknown. You know, they think they were being treated and, and various things going on, but uh, these men were over a period of, uh, I think it was 1930 to 1970, so almost 40 years of this happening. And so there's a bit of skepticism that comes from that. And so anytime someone that's from outside the community is or the various um, minority communities are talking about health and health related things, the skepticism is there because of the, the history and those very horrible and, and just, you know, atrocious things that were done. So Why should we trust the medical community? They haven't done good things for us in the past. Exactly. And oftentimes the medical community, medical community did not look like the community that's, you know, the 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 community out there abroad or out there in general. So it's easier for you know me to go in and have a conversation because some of the skepticism won't be there even though you know they may think I'm a part of uh, science or the medical establishment I can have a convers I can probably have a conversation easier and get more to having things flow and if it was someone that didn't look like me, or someone that didn't look like that particular community, so we're so you're able to connect people with experts that they can identify with, exactly. as opposed to experts that they may not necessarily feel a kinship with. Exactly, you know, and it, a lot of it comes down to trust. Um, if you want, if if we want underrepresented communities or minority communities to move more to and to different types of science they have to trust you know there's a lot like I mentioned before the use of technology but to have conversations about the impact of science and health and you know various other things uh, that go on in communities it's important you know to be able to connect uh, and I would say like on a like a personal background you know we can have conversations about you know, various aspects of life or growing up, and if you connect with someone, it's easy, easy to have a conversation. The person does not necessarily have to look like you or be the same gender or be from the same, you know, geographic region or country, but if you find a reason and a way to connect with them, the conversation usually is a little bit easier and you can convey some information. So so we're trying to, you know, do outreach through the dark side and, uh, and try to increase the science communication within um, underrepresented communities and minority communities and and also is di diversify because the conversations are different based on my I'm gonna have conversations based on my experiences you'll have conversations based on yours and the next person will have it based on theirs and so 
if the conversation, if I'm the only person leading the conversation, there's only my perspective. So it takes other people to be involved in it to get a perspective that's different from mine. So so I can say, well, oh, okay, I didn't think about that, but what you're saying makes sense. Um, this is a different way of thinking about it, and, maybe, and we can improve health or our general understanding of uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics based on the experiences. And so we all learn from each other. Cool. So we're running a little bit out of time. Okay. Um, but I just wanted to know, do you have any advice for people who might think what you do is really, really cool and might be interested in what you do and try to have your career? Do you have any advice for them as they seek a career in science? I would say try to learn as much as possible. Uh, so go on to social media. So if you're interested in, you know, let's say for instance, if you're interested in fighting um, heart disease or something, uh, you want to be, you know, you want to help people uh, be healthier for heart disease. Learn more about it. Use social media. Reach out and find a researcher that's doing that type of work, and have conversations with them. And you'll, and what you'll find most of the time through social media, you can basically get an informal mentor and you'll have someone that can help guide your career and help you know, help you learn from the things that they've learned and also avoid some of the mistakes that they made. Uh, so I would say find the information about it, read it, but the, the hardest thing as a scientist in translating uh, saying go find information is helping people understand how to do it. And in this age the easiest way to do it is to find someone that's doing what you may be interested in doing and, and trying to have a conversation with them. And social media, again, is the easiest way. You can send an email, and if you're like me, I get hundreds of emails every day. Most of them are you know, not going to get responded to because they're from various things, and I try to find the, the, the point of personal emails. But that may be slower. But if you send me a tweet or if you connect with me on uh, – my uh, through G plus or uh, Facebook, I have a Facebook page called First Generation STEM because I'm the first uh, first generation person in my family to get into uh, STEM and the first first person to, to um, get a PhD. And so I'm trying to you know encourage and pass the information along to uh, other generation students. But I would say use social media. Um, scientists are out there. We are willing to have conversations. And so, you know, talk and often to us. we like talking about science to people. Yeah, we, we love we love talking about science. If you don't love talking about science, it's kind of hard to do it. Uh, and it's oftentimes a lot better and more exciting to have conversations with people that aren't into science as much, because then we have to make sure we're communicating that science. And so it's easy to talk to another scientist because we have what we call jargon and. You know, we can talk about things that in a language that makes sense to us, but we have to speak the language of you know everyday folk to make sure that they understand it. And I like doing that. I, I like people to understand what I'm doing, not just cool. scientists, but anyway. Awesome. So thank you so much for coming on today and for talking about your work. Um, you can You're contact uh, Dr. Wilson on Twitter as at Hey Dr. Wilson. Um, I will also put up links to his Google Plus account and to his Facebook for First Generation STEM um, if you'd like to contact him to find out more about what he does and how to become a scientist. Right. Thank you very much, Caleb. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everybody.